I'm thankful I sense the presence of God. Amen? God is with us. We're so thankful that you're here today. Right before Jesus was going to celebrate communion in the upper room and go to Gethsemane and to the cross, we know it as the triumphant entry into Jerusalem and the, and the cleansing of the temple. That was the moment that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, goes right to the temple, and the Bible says he cleansed the temple. Jesus came into the temple, the Bible says, overturned the table of the money changers and said these powerful words, my house shall be called, do you remember it? A house of prayer. The cleansing of the temple was Jesus coming to remove and to restore. He was removing men's props and restoring the only thing that opens up the heaven. And this is so important because men had taken prayer out of God's house and have set up tables to buy and sell and to make money. By removing prayer, they now had to depend on what money can buy instead of what God can do. Let me say this again, because this sounds like what the church is facing today. By removing the prayer meeting, by removing people praying and depending on man's ingenuity and man's creativity, you now start depending on the money changers and the tables instead of prayer. Now the cleansing of the temple came in towards the end of Jesus' life in the Synoptic Gospels. That is Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called the Synoptic Gospels. They all seem to match. Luke 19, Mark 11, and Matthew 21 is the cleansing of the temple. Now this is something significant gets overlooked, and this is what I want you to get down. The cleansing of the temple occurs in the Gospel of John, not at the end of his ministry, like the other three, but at the beginning of his ministry, where Luke 19, Mark 11, Matthew 21, this is all prelude to the upper room and communion, to the cross and the trial of Jesus. But John chapter two launches Jesus's ministry that he comes to the temple and cleanses it. Now folks, this is the part I need you to see. There are two temple cleansings three years apart, because that was the extent and the length of Jesus's ministry. Now here's the question. Why do you have the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus's ministry and at the end of Jesus's ministry, okay? Here comes my New York answer. Here it is. Because junk always tries to come back into the temple. Because sin and just, it took three years that after you kicked them out the first time, that they showed up again. Now, folks, the stuff that Jesus kicked out somehow came back three years later and set up shop again. Now, this is sobering. You that are Christians in this place are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, I'm telling you, it's no different for this temple that junk is always trying to come back and live inside of your soul. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God and you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, which means just as the temple that Jesus cleansed, this temple, this body, this soul right here, I'm telling you, things that God, through his power, have kicked out are always trying to find its way back in. They're always trying to come back in. The great Puritan writer that David Wilkerson told me about is a man named William Grinnell, and he said this. He said, when Satan seems to have conceded defeat, do not assume that the battle is over. His flight should strengthen your faith, but not weaken your guard. I believe repentance is the very weapon to fight against the money changers waiting and wanting to come in and replace 
what God has established in the heart and soul of every believer. When you become born again, God does a renovation work of kicking out and, and restoring. God does a renovation work of redecorating and throwing out the old furniture. Jesus showed us two cleansings of the temple. And I believe, I have to say this for me personally, I believe my temple needs cleaning every single day. And temple cleansing of this soul of mine, I believe comes through repentance. And today is a call to repentance to the church and to the believer, to every pastor who has removed the message from the pulpit and from your sermons and have forgotten the word that brings freedom. I wanna challenge you to relook at this and to see how important this is. I was reading this. Folks, this is what's happening today. Don't miss this. It's in Patrick Morley's book, I Surrender. I want you to see this on the screen. He writes these powerful words. He says, the church's problem today is in the misconception, here it comes, that we can add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. And it is a change in belief without a change in behavior. It's revival without reformation and without repentance. Folks, do you see the power of that word? It's, it's without repentance, then all we're doing as a church is adding Christ to a life that needs a reformation, a life that needs rebuilding, a life. Folks, the goal of the gospel is not to add Jesus to our sinful life. It's to add Jesus and say, you be Lord and you take over every part of my life and do whatever you need to do. It's a wake up for the church. It's, we have created this delusional, delusional church that freedom comes from attendance or from a service or a seminar or a session. Folks, listen to me carefully. Bondage and sin are married. But it's not until repentance comes in and declares a divorce between those two and says, I am no longer going to walk in the bondage of what this sin begins to bring to my life. See, here, listen, L listen, leaders, when you sacrifice the message of repentance for popularity and so people can sit in your seats you're not far from having to compromise the scriptures and truth to keep them in their seats. Let me say that again, because some of you just, um, you missed what I just said here. When you sacrifice the message of repentance for popularity of a church, or for just to getting people to sit in the seats, then you'll not be far from compromising the scriptures and truth to keep them in the seats. See, folks, listen to me. Without, re I'm gonna say this, okay, e e email me, do whatever you want. Let me just, I, I say this probably every time. I, I don't care anymore, so here it comes. Without repentance in the church, when it's just, adding and never subtracting. Here it comes. Leaders, listen. New York City, listen. Without repentance, then the church starts supporting unbiblical lifestyles because we've preached about adding and never subtracting. I'll say that again because some of you are going, oh, I missed it because I really wanted to get Delina. I'll say it again for you. Here it comes. Without repentance in the church, then the preacher and the church has to support unbiblical lifestyles because you've just added Jesus without subtracting sin in the church. I'm just telling you. The moment... Listen, the moment you get saved, you don't get convicted about everything. But get ready. It's about to come. See, repentance is, is literally declaring Jesus as Lord over every area of our lives. That's what repentance is. If you want freedom, you can't leave it out. So many have seen the 360 lifestyle in their Christian life instead of the 180s. And what I mean by that is this. Let me say it like this. 
When I say 180, it means that you were heading one way and the change came was so profound through conviction, through a sermon, through truth, was so profound that now you're heading in a different direction. That's what 180 means. You're going this way. Conviction, truth. Something happens and you're going, this is the right direction. When I say 360, that means something caused you to stop something that may be harmful or sinful only to find yourself back involved again and again. That's why this word repentance is such a missing word. Do you understand that repentance was Jesus' first sermon and Jesus' last sermon? Listen, Matthew 4, 17. The Bible says when Jesus launches into his preaching ministry, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, what's his first word? Repent, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And do you understand that the last thing Jesus ever said in the last sermon he ever preached wasn't found in the Gospels. It's found in the book of Revelation. And his last sermon that he ever preaches is to the church of Laodicea. Listen to the last words that Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, he says to the church, be zealous and what? That's what he says to the church even at the very end. I remembered, I was thinking through the, when I think of those words, think of it for a moment. Jesus says, repent at the beginning. He says, repent at the ending. I was thinking of, of Leonard Ravenhill, who's been a man that has affected my life, a man that has prayed for revival, and a man who's been a spiritual father for, before God took him home many years ago. And Leonard Ravenhill said this, he said, if Jesus had preached the same messages that ministers preach today, he never would have been crucified. Some of you are just getting that now. Let me just say that again. If Jesus had preached the same message that's being preached today, he never would have been crucified. We have to understand why repentance is important. And we have to understand, and I'll get to it in a moment, the difference between repentance and remorse, feeling bad, and seeing change. Those are the two things. Because, we, because repentance brings change. I was reading several years ago, how many remember on Sundays, I remember used to coming home from church and reading the comics. Remember that in the newspapers, you used to have to read the comics. Saturdays you had cartoons and Sundays you had the Sunday comics. And it was the famous Peanuts comic strip that Lucy and Charlie Brown were practicing football. And those that know the story of Lucy and Charlie Brown, it's Lucy holds the football. And every time Charlie Brown comes to, comes to kick it, what does she do? She removes the football and he goes flying every single time. And the strip opened up with Lucy holding the ball, but Charlie Brown finally wising up and said, there's no way I'm doing this. And Lucy begged him to kick the ball. And finally, Charlie Brown said, every time I try to kick the ball, you remove it and I fall on my back. So they went back and forth. And then Lucy said these amazing words, Charlie Brown, I've been so terrible to you over the years, picking up the football. I've played so many cruel tricks on you, but I've seen the error of my ways. I've seen the hurt look in your eyes and I've deceived you. I've been wrong, so wrong. Won't you give a poor, penitent girl another chance? Charlie Brown was so moved by her display of grief and responded, of course, I'll give you another chance. Charlie Brown stepped back. She held the ball. And at the last moment, what do you think Lucy did? She picked up the ball. And that was it, fell. And this is what Lucy said, her last words. She says, recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things. Recognizing your faults and changing your ways. Lucy got it. Charlie didn't. The great Christian writer Eugene Peterson said it like this. He said, repentance is not an emotion. It's, the, it's not feeling sorry for your sins. It's a decision. It's deciding that you have been wrong and supposing that you could manage your own life and be your own God. It's both the feeling and the change. If I can say it to you this way, one little girl said it best. She said, repentance is best defined as this. It's to be sorry enough to quit. That's what it is. It's the emotion that goes, I can't continue on with this any longer. It's something affects your heart. And you're going, I don't want to go on much longer with this. We've all felt that. And then repentance is the step that changes it. When I was a young pastor, and we were just a small church, 
And I remember we had a food ministry and a dear friend who texted me just a few months ago, who's retired from ministry. I remember the heart, one of the hardest phone calls that I had to make a humbling phone call to a pastor that, that gave us money as a church to help us with our food ministry. We were feeding maybe 2,000 people a month in the city of Detroit. And because it was a struggling church, in the beginning, I remember um, we were faced with a difficulty the, the, that bills started to mount from electric bills and heating bills and all those things. And I remember us taking the money that was given for food ministry and used it to pay the electric bill, used it to pay the heating bill. And with, with this in mind, I just thought, well, you can't have a food kitchen if you don't have the lights and the heat. So I just said, let's go and do that. But that's not what the money was apportioned for. That's not what the money was given for. It was earmarked for food and to feed the poor on the streets of Detroit. And I remember going to the Lord in prayer one day and just asking for provision and asking God provide. And the Lord spoke to me and says, you took money and used it for something you weren't supposed to do. And said, you call that pastor and you repent. See, I felt it. But now the issue between remorse and repentance was whether I was going to pick up the phone and be honest. See, people think that just because you feel bad, the change is coming. But I knew I needed to pick up the phone and get honest with this, with this, with this pastor. And I remember, folks, I'm just telling you, I remember picking up the phone and calling this pastor. And it was not an easy phone call. And, and can I say to his credit, he didn't let me off the hook easy, e e e easy either. I just wanted him to, just to go like, oh, I love you. Go ahead. Just whatever we can do, we'll send another check. And that man, that man, and I'm grateful to this day because I felt it laid into my soul. And said, Tim, you need to learn now. That if somebody gives you money for this, you can't use it. That's lying. That's cheating. And folks, it stung. But the message came across. That I said, if it's said for that. And folks, listen to me. That was the difference. I felt God speak to me in prayer. That's the remorse. But in order to repent, I needed to change the, what I was doing. The actual word repentance means to change your mind. It's when you repent, you change your mind and realize that God's mind is better than my mind. It's you saying, God, you're telling me I shouldn't have used those finances that way. Your mind is better than my mind. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, now pick up the phone and call them. Now pick up the phone and tell your wife or deal with this situation. Come clean with this. See, repentance is brutal honesty with the soul. It's not hiding anything. It's keeping, it's shining a light on every dark area of our lives and saying, God, I want to, if you want to do whatever you want to do in this church, all I want to say is this, there is not going to be anything hidden in me. Folks, listen to me carefully. Listen to me. You can't pray for revival and an outpouring if there's not a repentance of the soul. God has to deal with our souls. See, repentance, get this down, changes our minds about four things. Listen to them. Listen to them. Because if repentance is a change, it changes our mind about ourself. It deals in our society with this inflated self-importance and realizes I'm not the star of the ministry. It's Jesus. It's not the choir or the singer. It's Jesus. It changes our mind that the songs aren't about you. So when people go, I didn't like that song, my response is, well, we weren't singing to you in the first place. So you're not the issue. So if you're here today and go, I don't like that song, it's not about you. It's not about your preference. It's he has to say, I don't like that song. Not you. He has to say that. It changes our mind about sin. We see sin seriously as God sees it. It's not a vice or a dysfunction. It's a crime against God. It breaks our fellowship with him. When we 
repent, we change our mind about the Savior. We see Jesus as our Savior, the only way to heaven, healing, and freedom. And it changes our mind about salvation. You see, it is not something you earn and deserve, but something that's done by grace. Now, I want to tell you why this is so important, why repentance today is vital in the church. It's vital in our lives. It's vital in this church. Now, folks, I want, you, I want you to get this down because this is so key with the culture that we live in. Listen, in a world without moral absolutes, repentance is so important. We live in a world with no moral absolutes. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? Everybody has their truth. Their, that's the, what we've loot. When we don't preach repentance, then we don't change our mind about our self-importance. You cannot sit. You cannot serve God. Folks, this is, uh, listen, uh, the whole message is going to get me in trouble, so it, it's, it's okay. You cannot serve God. You ready for this? You cannot serve God with your own truth. You can't sit here and go, well, this is my truth. You can't. The Bible says this, can two walk together unless they agree? You can't say I walk with Jesus because it's not a matter. Here's, listen, newsflash, Jesus doesn't have to agree with you. But you better agree with Jesus and what he has called you to do. And he says, I need you to agree with self, the Savior, sin, and salvation. See, without repentance, then we have added Jesus to our own personal beliefs. We, you, you may have changed your mind about Jesus, but you have not changed your mind about sin, about salvation, or maybe about anything else. Repentance is ultimate honesty. It's like when you get forgiveness of sin, Here, this is so important. This is such a key verse. Here it comes, folks. When you get forgiven, here it comes, you also get cleansed. He's not, this is, this is what frees us from adding. It's the adding and subtracting. Here it comes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just or righteous to do what? Oh, here it comes. And to what? Cleanse us from all and right. Folks, you don't get forgiveness without the cleansing that needs to come to our lives. See, we want forgiveness, but we don't want the second part of that. And here's what's great. He is faithful to forgive you. Oh, and he is faithful to cleanse you of what you've just been forgiven of. Amen. I like that, Pastor Tim. Let me tell you something. Because I know, I know this is going to get some of you angry. This, listen, listen. But I'm not preaching to you. Yes, I am. The word confession is an important word. If we confess our sins, you know what the word confession means? It means to say the same thing. That's all it means. That confession means you agree with God. How can two walk together unless they agree? See, what 1 John 1, 9 is saying is, is there is forgiveness but there's also cleansing. You got forgiven, now it's time for God to come in and to cleanse. See, when you repent, you are saying, I not only need God's forgiveness, but I also need his help to be free. That's what the cleansing part is. That's, the, that's what God does inside of our lives. It's you saying, God, I agree. I see my destructive behavior. It's affecting my marriage. It's affecting my personal life. It's affecting my mind. The, it's, it's, it's becoming toxic in my soul. See, God forgives, but he also cleanses. That's the repentance part. I remember I was in my office when I first started in ministry, and a kid, right, we had, we, our church was right by the projects, and while I was in my office, they, the, the secretary that was there said, hey, somebody is here to see you. I don't know who he is, but it's a young man who came across from the pro projects. And this young man came into my office, and he just goes, I need to get right with God. And then he laid a loaded gun on my desk and just goes, I shot someone last night. So I quickly, before leading him to the Lord... I quickly took the gun out of the way because in order, for me, in order for me to speak the truth, I wanted to make sure there was no barriers in the way. 
in what I was going to say. And, I, and I, I'm just telling you, I quickly took all the bullets out of the gun because it was loaded. And, he go, and I said, is that the gun that you shot someone with last night? He said, yes. And I said, Did, do you know if it was injured or killed? He says, I have no idea. And I remember leading this kid to the Lord right there. Gun was, was right next to my desk as we were leading him to the Lord. And then the next thing I said to him, I says, now God has forgiven you, but he has to cleanse your soul. And I said, in order for us to do this, and, and God visibly touched this young man. And I looked at him and I said, and now we're going to take the gun down to the police station and you're going to tell him what you did last night. And he looked at me and he said this, absolutely. He goes, let's go. And folks, I watch, because when God, when it's true forgiveness, then cleansing is what begins to come next. He wasn't adding Jesus, he was subtracting the sin that would seem to come. See, that's why repentance and remorse are not the same. That's the, th this is the, the issue is that remorse is lesser. It's sorrow. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. It's still picking up the football for Charlie Brown. But repentance is a deliberate action to say, we take the gun down to the police station. It's going, I want forgiveness, but I also want cleansing in my life. I want God to cleanse it. The reason why we pulled so many 360s is because we've been forgiven, but we've never been cleansed. We've never had God come in and cleanse us. From Folks, let, let, let me show you something that has been so, I, 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 it, was, it just jumped off the page to me. And I want you to get ready to see this because I've watched what the, this, this whole issue of the difference between remorse and repentance in this one phrase throughout the Bible. And it's this, it's this phrase, I have sinned. And I want to show you, just, I'm just going to go through them quick. Seven people who said in the Bible, I have sinned. I have sinned. And you're going to see the difference of remorse and repentance. First one is Pharaoh. Listen to it. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron said, here it comes. I have what? Sin, the Lord is righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked. And you think, this is Exodus 9. You think, okay, Pharaoh is all good. Pharaoh is about to become a Christian. Look, look what happens. And the Bible says in verse 34, but when Pharaoh saw the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned, 360. He sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. You know what I call that, folks? You ready for this? I call that timed repentance. It means you repent until the skies clear up, until you know you're out of danger or you just got cleared in court and you know you don't have to pay a fine and you know they dismissed your case and you go and you realize they're not going to fire me. It's when, when, we're, when we realize the clouds are, are, are gloomy and the skies are dark, everybody wants God to intervene. But once the sky clears up, it's so easy to go back to an old way and an old life. And it's a repentance that's timed based upon when the skies clear up. And then there's Balaam. Look at Balaam. Numbers 22, 34. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now if it's displeasing to you, I will turn back. This was an angel that was about to kill Balaam. And Balaam's life was a step away from perishing. This is death repentance. This is going like, what? What's the report, doctor? What did the blood work say? What's going on here? And all of a sudden, this is Balaam. And Balaam ends up getting killed for all the bad decisions. Then there's, you know this one. Then there's Achan. Achan was the man that stole gold in the battle of Jericho. And the Bible says when he finally found out, if you remember the story, it was Joshua goes, why did we lose our next battle? And God says, there's sin in the camp. Someone stole something that I said, don't touch all of the proceeds that come from Jericho. Achan stole it and hid it in his tent. And God revealed and exposed who did this. He didn't confess. He got exposed. And here's what it says. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. You know what that is? That's exposed repentance. When I sit in counseling, I always will ask people that maybe where sin got uncovered, I said, did they confess it or did it get exposed? 
Because if it got exposed, then we don't know if their heart's in the right place. If they, re, if they, if they confessed and repented, then we have a shot here. But I, but I, and I've looked at husbands, and I've looked at young people, and I've said this. I said, did you expose it? Did someone, re- listen, did, did your wife read your, your visa bill? And, and, or did your wife see a text that came in, and all of a sudden you got all sorry that they saw something? I said, let's just be clear. You are still suspect right now. Because we don't know. Some of you are going like, don't counsel with Pastor Tim. <laughs> then there's Shimei. For those that don't know Shimei, this is a guy that was throwing rocks at David before he became king. And then when David became king, Shimei comes into the throne room of the new king and repents just so he can get his life and get his old life back. 2 Samuel 19.20, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all, to the house of Joseph. This is a reward repentance. Shimei is not talking to David, not talking to David the refugee, but David the king. And basically what he is just saying is, can we just forget what happened when I threw rocks at you? This is the reward repentance. I'm repenting, but please don't hurt me. Don't divorce me. I don't want to pay child support. Don't fire me. I need the health insurance. It's admission without the mind change. I just don't want you to mess up what I've got here. And Shimei eventually breaks out and and begins to walk in rebellion and eventually gets killed. And then the one that scares me very much is Saul. We talked about him during the worshiping backslider. Saul said he sinned to Samuel the prophet, but he said, honor me in front of all the people. Look at this. He said, I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. You know what I call that repentance? I call that the let's move on repentance. I call that the I don't want to lose my position repentance. I did it. I get it. Can we just pick up where we left off? Well, we don't know if your mind has changed. We don't know if something is going on. I'm the king, I'm the king, let's just rewind and keep going. It's kind of an embarrassed repentance. But here's the two that stood out to me. You ready for this, church? Listen to five and to six and seven. It's David and the prodigal son. You're gonna see the difference. Second Samuel 12, 13, David said to Nathan when he was discovered for sinning with Bathsheba, he said, I have sinned, what is the next phrase? Against the Lord. Look at the prodigal. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. They recognize that they've sinned against God the Father. They're not repenting to get something. They're not repenting because I don't want to be embarrassed. They're not repenting to say, let's just move on. They're repenting. Their repentance has now realized it is before God that I've sinned. It is God. That's what David says in Psalm 51, 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Why does, why does Numbers 1 through 5, the, these men become 360 men? It's because it had to do with their own benefits. But never was this against God. I'm, I'm, I'm affecting my relationship with God. When you don't realize that you're, you're doing this, you set yourself up for the 360. That's what Saul is. Saul is a 360 man. Folks, listen to this. When I was reading the life of Saul, Saul tried to kill, don't miss this. Saul tried to kill David four times. He tried to murder. This man who is the king of Israel tried to murder David four different times. In 1 Samuel 18, he throws a spear at the wall and David kind of gives him slack and just says, well, maybe it's a bad day. And then it happens again one chapter later. Folks, I don't know about you. My boss throws a spear at me. Folks, I'm just telling you, it's, I'm on monster.com. It's a brand new job at that point. One, one spear is all I need. I don't need you to throw it. I don't need you to throw a second. 1 Samuel 19, Saul throws a second one. Then David leaves and Saul hunts for him. In 1 Samuel 24, the Bible says that God protected David. And when David confronted Saul from a distance, the Bible says that Saul wept for what he has done. And then when you get to 1 Samuel 26, 21, 
He says it in 1 Samuel 26, 21. I have sinned, David. Folks, here's the part that gets me. Saul's third time, he's trying to kill David. He's weeping. The fourth time, he's trying to murder David. He says, I have sinned. But here's what's amazing. Don't, don't miss this. But every, he never changes. He never changes. He throws it in 1 Samuel 18. He throws spears in 1 Samuel 19. He hires 3,000 men to kill David in 1 Samuel 24. And then again in 1 Samuel 26. Folks, the first time it happens, it was a sin that he should have repented over. Here it comes, and I felt strongly about this. He, l- l- listen, lean in on this. But what Saul was doing, he was flirting with envy and jealousy in his heart that would turn into a murder. Folks, some of you are flirting with thoughts and and sinful things that you have no idea the bondage it can bring you into. You're sitting here today listening to this, thinking to yourself, well, this is a negative church. This is a church. This is a real downer today. I wish they'd just get back up there and sing. This guy is negative, and and on top of that, he spits on everybody on the front row. Okay. Here's Here's what I want you to get. Here's what I want you to get. This is not that, folks, we're trying to get you set free today. Set free today. And some of you, I'm telling you, balcony, listen to me. Some of you are flirting with bitterness, you're flirting with pornography, and you think that you've got a handle on this. Saul thought he had a handle on the jealousy and envy, and all of a sudden, he had something in his hand, and it turned into a murderous spirit. You are flirting with something. You may be a Christian leader listening online from around the world, and you're flirting with something, or someone. Listen. And you may be here today, you may be a businessman, you may work on Wall Street, and all of a sudden you know you're married and finding yourself flirting with something. And I'm telling you, there has to come a repentant spirit that says, God, not just forgive me, but God, I want this thing to die once and for all. I am tired of this thing coming up over and over and over again. Something dangerous happens when the 360 men are continuous. And here it comes, folks, listen. When, when God is speaking and every time you keep going around in 360s, something dangerous begins to happen and it's called a hard heart. You become hardened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Saul says the right words, but there's no lifestyle to back it up. Matthew 3, 8 says you have to produce fruit in keeping with Repentance. I was leaving a prayer meeting when I first started in ministry. And there was, there was imaginations and fantasy in my mind that God was convicting me of. I heard the Holy Spirit just saying, let that go, let that go, let that go. Nothing was done, just imaginations. I remember leaving a prayer meeting and folks pulling into my garage in Detroit, and I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. It says, you need to kill this thing once and for all. You're flirting with something. You're flirting with thoughts that can manifest. That's why David says, don't miss this. David says, Let, when, when, when David speaks about cleansing in, in his heart and in his life, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, oh God. Do you understand what David is saying? He's saying, I don't even want it to get to here. I want it dealt with when it's up here. Folks, listen, this is for some of you. This is for some of you that this, this is getting, this is getting toxic. This is getting to a place of jealousy, envy. There's stuff that is coming up here and God says, no, 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 not just the words I say. See, see, if you're sitting here today and you're struggling and you're going, well, I don't know why these words, I keep saying these words like this. I don't know why I keep just exhibiting anger. If anger is coming up because there's anger in the heart. And what he was saying was when you saw it in the heart, I wanted it cleansed. But instead of dealing with it from the first Samuel 18, from the first spear throw, now you're chapters into this 
and people are getting hurt and there's dead bodies everywhere because you didn't take care of it back there. Folks, listen, I understand how intense this is, but this is so important because the Bible says there has to be fruits of our repentance. Matthew 3, 8 says it in another translation like this, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and you've turned to God. Now folks, I'm, I wanna give this to you so fast and then close. Um, because when you start to realize when those thoughts seem to come, what you're faced with, I was thinking of the prayer of Augustine, one of the early church fathers who spoke so honestly that none of us would dare to say, but listen to his true but tragic prayer. He said this, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. <laughs> Think of that. It's true, tragic, and some of us are like that. God, make me pure, but not just yet. Make me pure when it embarrasses me. Make me pure when my family gets messed up. Make me pure when all of a sudden, when my marriage seems to be on the rock. Make me pure. Folks, I'm telling you, before it even gets into the hands and to the mouth, it's make me pure now, Lord God. It is come and bring purity to me now. That's what God wants to do. See, the Apostle Paul says, here's the fruits of repentance. Let me, let me just read a quick passage and I want to just list this to you, and then we're going to get ready to close. In fact, the keyboardist, Mark, you can come. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says, the fruit of what repentance is. Because it's not just tears, and it's not just, it's not just responding to an altar, and it's not just going to church. It's not just feeling bad. This is what I've been asking God for for my own life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He said, for godly sorrow produces What? Repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, folks, here it comes. Watch the fruit of repentance. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in the God. He says, the very thing that you were asking for cleansing from. He says, what carefulness it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire, what zeal, what vindicate. In all these things, you proved yourself to be clear in this. Do you see the fruit of repentance up here? He says, it's not from weeping. It's not even from confession. He says, when a heart has repented, this is what he says. He says, there'll be a carefulness. There'll be a clearing of yourselves. There'll be an indignation. A fear of the Lord will start to rise up. A vehement desire, a new zeal, and a vindication will begin to come. Folks, let me just tell you, let me, let me just tell you really quickly what, what all these are. This is, he said carefulness. You know what that is? He says you'll start to stay away from anything that would bring you back into it. You're not careful when all of a sudden you keep certain things on the phone that should have been deleted. Oh, let me continue on because I know it's just, I get it. There's also, he says, a clearing of yourselves. It means you're going to make things right. It's a phone call. It may be restitution financially because you kept money that didn't belong to you. I had a young man come into my office one time and he was a backslider and he said, I came in, I wanted drug money, so I broke in to a, a convenience store and I, I broke in, stole a whole bunch of stuff, but I want to get right with God. I said, great, we're going to go back to the store and you're going to make restitution to the store. Once again, don't go to Pastor Tim if you want counsel. Because if it's real repentance, there's a clearing of yourself to say, I don't want anything to be out there. He says, what indignation. That means there's a sense of anger there's, this, there's a new feeling that says, this is what was taken from me. There's a new fear. Number four, he says, there's a renewed fear of the Lord. That you're, that, uh, and to some degree, it's not only a fear of the Lord, but it's a fear that frightened what could have happened. I could have lost my wife, my kids. I could have lost trust. Vehement desire means it's a longing and a feeling. You start adding this vehement desire, start adding godly disciplines that were not present before to avoid this. What zeal. A renewed fire for the Lord starts to come. A new devotion of consistency. 
And then it ends with what vindication. Another version says, King James says, what revenge. It's almost like this. A revenge comes to you to inflict upon the enemy for stealing from you and to say, this is not, I'm going to rescue everyone that I can. I want to close with this. Allow me for just a moment to draw from a, my past when I was growing up. I think it'll make things clear. It was something that broke a 360 in my life and turned it into a 180. In, and it's humorous in the beginning, but I knew God was going after something. I was born and raised in the church. L- literally, our church that, that, that I was, my parents went to the church right across the street from Madison Square Garden. It's no longer there. I, my my mom was pregnant with me. Some of you don't even know this, what this word means during the Christmas cantata. How many remember the word cantata? We don't use that word very much anymore. My mom was pregnant with me during the Christmas cantata. I literally was almost born during the Christmas concert at the church. I was born and raised in the church. But once again, the enemy will just, does, that, that, that's not our protection. What ours, our protection is Jesus himself. The church, it's not the church, it's not, a, it's not religion, it's not a denomination. So growing up, even close to some of my, I mean, junior high and everything else, it, it, it sounds silly, but I know that God was dealing with something. I had a problem stealing when I was growing up. Okay, let me finish. I remember I got caught one time. My dad would bring home from the police department. There was a time in the 60s and the 70s that you'd have cash and you'd get change and in circulation was all the, uh, you'd have silver dimes and silver quarters and silver half dollars. And my dad would have a big thing in his dresser. And while he was sleeping after working the, the, the shift, many times from eight to four shift here in New York City, I'd sneak in, grab a handful of money, put it in my pocket. Folks, I wasn't buying drugs. I was buying baseball cards is what I was doing. It wasn't anything like that. And I remember walking, my dad was sleeping, and I remember walking out, and there was a big wad of money. And my mom goes, what's that? And she's, she's looking, she's looking at this. And she says, and I said, well, it's money. She goes, where did you get that? I said, the Lord provided. She goes, he didn't provide, he didn't provide silver half dollars and silver dimes. He, doesn't, he didn't give you that. And she, this is what she told me. I remember this to this day. Mark, I'm telling you, I was, I, I must have been 11, 12 years old. I remember her looking at me. This is what's a blessing, having a godly mom. She looked at me and says, if you don't tell me, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, and he's going to tell me. It took about three nanoseconds. I'm a thief. I'm a thief. I'll never do it again. As soon as she said, the Holy Spirit's going to tell me. That was it. I was done. All you had to say was the Holy Spirit was going to tell me. That was the thing. Just crushed me at that point. She woke my father up. He came out. And this is what he said to me. He goes, he said this. He goes, if I ever catch you stealing again, this, folks, just understand, this is, this is a long time ago. He goes, I'm going to burn your hand off. That's what he told me. And he's a Christian. It, the Holy Spirit got me more than the burning of my hand off because I'm just going like, I'll sue. And, and, I, and so I'm not really worried about that. Folks, it was probably... I don't know, months, a year later, I was stealing from my, some other family members. I was taking money from them and I got caught again. And my dad goes, where did you get that money? And I, I just said, I, I stole it. And this is what my dad said. He said, wait right here. He went to our tool room and he comes back with a propane torch. And he, and he took, turns it on, hits the flint to turn it on. And I'm going, he's lost his mind. Seriously, this is it. I'll never be able to turn a page in the Bible again. It's just, it's over at this point. And 
the flame comes out and all of a sudden I'm weeping, praying that my tears would put out the flame at that point. I don't know what to do at this point. And, and all of a sudden, he goes, I told you, but God is a God of mercy. I said, yes, he is. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My dad's a godly man. He wasn't burning my hand off. But here's what's crazy. I was back at it again. Holy Spirit, propane, fire, everything. What is it? What is it? It's remorse. It's the 360. It was remorse. I've sinned. Mom, don't. No, don't ask the Holy Spirit. I've sinned. No, don't burn my hand off. Now, here's the part I want you to get. Because I never got to that I've sinned against the Lord. Do you know when it happened? It happened at a camp, a church camp. That's why we tell you with Stan and 212 to get those teens to camp. Sign them up and get them there. I was at a camp and I'm in, a, I'm in the, if you've ever been to a church camp's bookstore and gift shop, it's always, it's nothing. There's like, they've got glow in the dark crosses and everything. And there was a whole thing of comic books. I picked up a comic book and it was a comic book of the book called The Late Great Planet Earth on the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Folks, I read this comic book. I put that, I said, I'm not going to hell. I said, because he had in there Revelation 21.8 that says no thieves will have their part. I said, and I, I go, I'm a thief. I'm, the fire didn't make me confess that. The Holy Spirit's got, that didn't, a comic book showed me I've sinned against God. Folks, I'm telling you, I went to the camp counselor. I said, he thought I was out of my, I said, I got to talk to you. I said, I am a thief. He's looking at me going, you're 12. I like, like, what are you, what are you, I said, I'm a thief. I've stolen from everybody. I said, I'm a thief. And I said, and I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. And I said, right now, I got to get this thing right. I'm 12 years old. Folks, some of you look at this going, oh, that's so cute. No, 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 no. I had no idea what God was saving me from. Because you're responding to what the Holy Spirit, because when you don't respond, like I said, it's that scary word of hardness of heart that just keeps going on and on. You know what a hard heart is? It's one that ignores, refuses, and even dislikes the interruptions of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Do you know what a hard heart is? It's one that ignores, refuses, and dislikes when the conviction of the Holy Spirit begins to come in and really, you ready for this, and messes up your Sunday service. You're going, I was coming to rejoice. I wanted to stand up. And this guy's messing up my whole Sunday. Mm -mm. We're saving you for what God wants to do inside of your life. That's why, folks, let me, let me just say, as you stand, because I want you to feel like we're done. Stand with me. I have to say this to you. In the book of Hebrews, a phenomenon takes place that I didn't notice until yesterday. I'm looking through Hebrews and I'm going, this is a phenomenon. I've never seen this before. And it talks about this word of a hard heart. And four times God warns the Christian about a hard heart four times in two chapters. It's, 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 I've never seen this before in the New Testament. And list, listen to it. You ready for this? I'm reading through this and it goes, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Then in verse 13, but encourage one another as long as it is still called What? so that none of you will be hardened by the deceit. This is all coming right after the other, like a, like a shotgun. Then, then two verses later, today, if you hear his voice, what does it say? Do not harden your heart. And then you go over into the next chapter. He says he fixes a certain day. Today. He says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. L look at me, folks. The key word is today. Today is God's word. 
Tomorrow is Satan's word. Tomorrow is, let me, let me say that again. Listen, listen. Now is God's word. Today, right now. Today, that's God's word. Tomorrow is the enemy's word. I want you just to close your eyes for a second. I want to read to you something. The great Christian preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said, that if you were sick, would you send for a physician tomorrow? If your house were on fire, would you call fire tomorrow? If you're robbed in the street or on your road home, would you cry, stop thief, tomorrow? He said, no, but man is foolish in the things that concern his soul. And less divine and infinite love shall teach him to number his days. He goes on boasting of tomorrow until his soul has been destroyed by them. And then he says this, the road to hell gets paved with good intentions. You lingerers, pull up the paving stones, hurl them at the devil's head. He's ruining you. He's decoying you. He's saying tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And Spurgeon goes, alas, tomorrow never comes. It is in no calendar except the almanac of fools. It's never tomorrow. We deal with it today. If you're sitting in this place, annex, main floor, balcony, the Holy Spirit is going, I want to cleanse this. I want this cleansed. I want this cleansed. Not forgiven of, I want to cleanse. That the 360s that you've been pulling need to stop today. With God's help, we're going to believe for the Holy Spirit to do that right now. We're going to believe for God to do it right now. That God is going to come right now and do a mighty work. Folks, listen. Don't wait to talk. Don't sit there while you know God is speaking to you. Look at me for a moment. Everybody look at me. If you hear his voice right now, thank God. If you feel conviction right now, thank God. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And because he is, you know what that means when you feel, if you're here today and you feel convicted, you know what that's called, folks? That you don't have a hard heart, that God is still talking to you. He's rescuing you. He's rescuing you. He's rescuing you. He's rescuing you. This is a day of freedom. It's a day, folks, this is a day to be liberated. He's going to cleanse hearts today. He's going to cleanse hearts today. And if you're here right now and say, Pastor Tim, I want this thing done and over with. I'm tired of 360s. I want a complete change. Balcony, main floor. I want you to get out of your seat right now. I want to pray quickly, as fast as you can. Get out of your seat and go, no more 360s. This is going to be a day of free. Quickly, I'm going to wait for you because I believe God wants to do a work of freedom in this place today. This is a moment that God is calling you to say, let's get this thing taken care of once and for all. Balcony, we're going to wait for you to come down and we're going to believe for the Holy Spirit just to come and do a mighty work in this place today. Folks, and if some of you are going like, I don't want to be, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm, who cares? At this point, let's leave this place in freedom. Let's leave this place in liberty. Let's leave this place. Balcony, we'll wait for you. Main floor, come on, quickly, get in, get in. Move all the way in here. God is going to do a work in this place. I want to believe for God to come. There's a there's a song. Listen, there's an old psalm. It's called a psalm of repentance. When David began to ask God to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. How many remember that psalm? It was David after David's going like, I don't want to live with this thing anymore in my life. I want this thing done. And, it, and there's, there was a way uh, who's going to be with us stirring fire in our bones. His name is Donnie McClurkin. He, used to, he, he would, would sing like, he goes, create in me a clean heart and purify me purify me create in me a clean heart and why may work those aren't the right words you have to get the right words create in me a clean heart create in me a clean heart and purify, purify, purify me. Create in me a clean heart so I may work. That's all there is to it. Come on, sing it with me. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart and purify. 
right there. That's the prayer of David. It was the prayer of David that was finding himself turning the 360s. Some of you being so upset with yourself going like, it's just the same thing over and over again. I'm looking at all the precious people that are in this place today. And folks, let me give, let me give you some hope today. Let me give you hope today. The Bible is clear when it begins to remind us that a righteous man will fall seven times, but will get back up again. Will rise back up again. And even in the midst of failures, I want to believe for the Holy Spirit to break through today. You may have not used these words before, but today we're going to use them. We're going to say, God, I repent of my sin today. Come on, I want you to lift your hands to him right now and just say, God, I repent. Just tell him right now. Just say, God, I repent. I repent of those things. Ask him right now. Come on, just say, God, forgive me and cleanse me right now. Would you ask him? Come on, out loud. Just go, God, forgive me and cleanse me of that sin that has held me in bondage. Forgive me and cleanse me. That God, I don't want, I'm thankful that I hear your voice right now. I'm thankful that I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit right now. Oh God, we need your cleansing right now over this church. I need it in my own life, oh God. The enemy seems to try to come in in so many different ways from what we see, what has happened to us, all that's taken place. But today, we pray, Lord God, clean hearts at this altar today. Break the patterns, break the chains, break the bondages, oh God that are seeking to destroy marriages, that are seeking to destroy young people's lives and their future. But today is a day of victory in this house, oh God. It's a day of victory, oh God. It's a day that says, oh God, we need a miracle here today. So God, I pray you break chains, you break bondages, and you set free. Today we declare we've sinned against you and you alone, oh God. We want our relationship with you restored. God, come and do a work here at this altar. Come and do a work inside of our lives today, oh God. Father, I just pray, come for these precious people that just said it's been over and over and over and over again. And I pray no more 360, but 180s today, Lord God. 180s. That said, God, you're going to liberate us. You're going to set us free today. You're going to work a miracle today inside of our hearts and lives. We're not repenting because we want something. We're not repenting because, because we're in bad. We're repenting because we want that relationship with God above all else. And we are believing for that miracle to take place today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name today. In Jesus' name today. Folks, I want, to, I want to just say something. I am so thankful. Let, let me tell you what, re, what a repented heart does. It's brutal honesty. For you to be at this altar is just honest. You walk by people, you left that, you left those seats. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you what certain people do. They're going like, I wonder what's going on with them. I wonder what they're, who cares? Let them get free today. Let freedom come today. Let the Holy Spirit. I, I, I just want to say, thank you for being honest. I'm looking at the aisle that goes down here. I'm looking at all these folks, and I'm just going, listen, I'm with you. What he's doing is he's cleansing the temple again. So what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's flipping over this table. He's coming in and going like, thank you. Let's flip the tables over and let's start rebuilding the heart and soul again. That's what he's doing. Some furniture has been set up in your soul that God goes, no, 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 that came back. We flipped that over. the first. How many know what I'm talking about? We flipped that over the first time. Can I tell you what I love about this church? Can I just tell you what I love? I love your honesty. I love, I love that you're serious about God. And let me tell you what I do. I, I know we got to close here because, because it's time. I love this section right here when we get to see all those that are part of the translation ministry, the, that, that we, the sign language. I love this because I'm looking at somebody over here that responded to the altar call and they're telling them 
what I'm saying in sign language over here, which means nobody is going to miss anything of what the Holy Spirit wants to say to them. But here's what's awesome. Even if they do miss me as I'm watching them sign my name, uh, not my name, but sign my words, let me tell you what's exciting to me. Even, even if they miss it, the Holy Spirit still comes down and speaks inside of their soul and inside of their heart. <laughs> Folks, I know this is a heavy word today. I know it's a heavy word today. But folks, it's, it's, it's the reason why there's so much bondage, why people will sit in a worship service and they're antsy to get out, to get into their car and to get out of church today because there's no freedom. When there's freedom, you're going, let's sing, let's worship, let's do whatever God wants us to do. But when there's not freedom, you want out. It's this. Okay, hurry up. we got to get there because all those people start coming to the Hampton Inn and all of a sudden they're going to try. That's, that's what happens. When there's no freedom, you want out of this place because you feel the heat turning up and you're going. But when God sets you free, I'm telling you, something begins to happen inside of your soul. So here's what we're going to do. Those at this altar, listen carefully now. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Every day, ask God to cleanse the temple every day. That's what you're going to pray. What, what do I pray? If you don't know what to pray, go to Psalm 51. Pray the prayer of repentance. It's a prayer of repentance. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Look what it says. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with the will. Folks, that, that's it. Let, go, go, back, go back to that verse 10. Go back. Go backwards. Go back. Go, go, give, okay, come on. Let's lift those hands and say this with me. Say, create in, come on, in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know what he says? This is what he says. Here's the good news. When you pray that, I want you to see verse 13. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners. Woo! I don't think I've ever said woo from the pulpit will be converted to you when the people walk in repentance god goes people start getting saved when people start walking in repentance they're going you're free i want that i don't want people coming to a church that we're living in bondage i want to be set free in this place today so let me make it clear if you're sitting here today, if you're sitting here today and say, Pastor Tim, I've never known what it is to have that relationship with God. I don't, you don't even know what conviction is because you're going like, I don't know. But you've never experienced the forgiveness of God and the cleansing of God where he walks into the soul and restores and changes you from the inside out. It's called being born again. And he can change. You know what you're watching here today? You're watching people going, God, I want to walk in freedom. I want to walk in freedom and liberty today. And folks, you know what this is? I, I've got to believe verse 13 that you're sitting here watching online and you're just going, I want to be set free today. I want Christ in my life. I want freedom today. If you've never been born again, it can happen to you right now. Jesus can come in and change you from the inside out. If you've never prayed a born again prayer to say, God, come in, forgive me and cleanse me. That can happen right now. How does it happen? Simple as A, B, C. A, admitting I'm a sinner. B, believing that Jesus came and died for my sin. And C, confessing him as Lord. That he'll take over my life. Not just on Sundays, but every single day. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I've never prayed that prayer. It's the most important question. Because no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. If you're here today and say, would you... Would you, when you pray that born again prayer, would you include me? Every head up, everybody looking around. No need to be embarrassed if you go, hey, put me in that prayer. I want to start a journey with God today. Hold up your hand as high as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. Keep them up as high as you can. I want to see every hand that's up. 
Come on, balcony, main floor, keep them up. Got you there, 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 there. Over here, over here, all the way in the back there, 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 there. Balcony, I want to make sure I see you back there. Awesome. Come on. Online, you type in that I'm making a decision. Hey, let's pray this, and then we're going to close in a song. Come on, say this with me out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hallelujah.